There we are. So good morning. Um, we are going to talk today about memories uh, in Europe. And uh, before I really start on to memories, I have to talk to you about one particular painter that doesn't have a box that we can fit him in, which means uh, he's not a Florentine, he's not a Roman painter, he didn't go to Rome, he stayed pretty much in the north, and he's absolutely a fantastic artist, at least to my eyes. And so uh, we're going to start with him. But first of all, I would like to uh, show you the timeline. So you have an idea where all these artists uh, lived. And the, the artist in particular I'm going to start with is Correggio. Uh, Correggio stayed uh, pretty much into his own town of Correggio and in Parma, where uh, that wasn't too far off and uh, uh, spent most of the time over there. Um, we'll look at a pretty good series of work that he did and that are so particular and so beautiful. So uh, Correggio is there, he's from the north, that's why I put him in the blue color similar to Raphael as Raphael was coming from Urbino. We have Giulio Romano who is going to be one of the big influences uh, on uh, mannerism. He was uh, one of the people that worked side by side with Raphael in the Pope's uh, apartments. And uh, at the time of the death of Raphael and the sack of Rome, he left in a hurry. Uh, he left Rome in a hurry and was invited to go to Mantua where he's gonna do a tremendous amount of work. The other great name that is really kind of the, the source, if you want, of uh, uh, mannerism and one person who was actually the teacher of both Pontormo and Bronzino is Andrea del Sarto. We also look at him and uh, we look at both his um, students. We'll look later on at another timeline that shows a later part of the 16th century. Uh, we consider that uh, mannerism starts around that end of the first quarter of the uh, 16th century. So let's go and talk about Correggio. He was born in the town of Correggio and under the name of Antonio Allegri da Correggio, so coming from Correggio. And this is the name he's going to keep. He was born in 1489, which is about the same time as uh, Raphael, by the way. Uh, he apprenticed in Modena, where he was influenced by Lorenzo Costa and Francesco Francesco, that are not very known uh, name. Lorenzo Costa a little bit, but the other one uh, not so much. And took a trip to Mantua in 1506. Um, he came back to Correggio in 15, at the end of 1506 and stayed there until 1510, before he settled in Parma in 1516. He married shortly uh, after uh, Girolama Francesca di Braghettis, who unfortunately died 10 years later. And uh, himself died uh, pretty young, as you can see, at the age of 44. Uh, he died suddenly after relocating in Correggio a few years uh, earlier. He became one of the most important influences in early Baroque period. And we'll see that next year, once, I mean, next school year, if we see, when we go back to the Baroque period and we'll see how his dynamic and his constructions uh, and expressions and the light that he brings into his pictures are really going to uh, find a lot of followers, uh, particularly in the North. So I'm just bringing in uh, two paintings by uh, Lorenzo Costa and Francesco Francia. So you have an idea uh, of uh, Francesco Haibolini is, Francesco, uh, is uh, the same as uh, the, the teacher that he had. So here are two people that were influent on him and we can see uh, there some influence from uh, the Bellinis and then also from uh, both Botticelli and um, uh, some other uh, friend, uh, sorry, Florentine uh, painters. 
Some of the early works of Correggio is uh, the, for the Duomo of the city of Parma, the Assumption of the Virgin, in that quite in incredible dome. And to see how we can understand how, in fact, uh, here the, he really anticipates this uh, sensational, we, we can really use the term, um, ceiling painting that we'll find during the, the Baroque period with that the very dramatic illusionism uh, that is used when you really have the sense that these uh, figures there are kind of hanging in the ceiling that you have a real vision of heavens. So uh, this is actually, as I said, the assumption of the Virgin. The I want to show you some details. And here are from the side there, the apostle uh, Peter and Paul. Uh, this is one of, of the details. And you can see how the extreme um, perspective that he's using, what is called in Italian, di sotto di, uh, and sotto di su. Di sotto in su, that's it. Di sotto in su is really giving you the feeling when you look up that you are the people that are hanging above your head. And here are some other, this is St. Peter, of course, um, with the keys. A very dramatic, very powerful. Uh, there is definitely an inspiration of Michelangelo in the anatomy of the figures, uh, but, um, Correggio never made it to Rome, but definitely they were engraving, circulating, uh, showing the work of the great master. He was then, he received the, the a very interesting commission for the nunnery of St. Paul. Uh, at the end of the 15th century, beginning of the 16th century, uh, the nunnery of St. Paul became one of the most active meeting places for the intellectuals in Parma. The nunnery was uh, headed from 1507 to 1524 by a very astute and cultured, very useful mother superior, Giovanna da Piacenza. And uh, She's the one who called on uh, Correggio to decorate what you would not believe is her bedchamber. So this doesn't really correspond to what we think of nunneries with the small cells. This was not the case in all the convents. Some convents were extremely luxurious and um, really allowed the nuns to have a very comfortable life. And don't forget that many of them didn't come there by vocation but came with the idea that they wanted to flee a husband they didn't want to marry. They knew that if they were marrying, they were um, incurring the risk, very real risk of dying in childbirth. And so many young women would choose uh, to become nuns and have a pretty pleasant life where in fact they were out of the authority of their father or their husband and uh, were able for those that were cultivated to uh, write, to uh, compose, to do all kinds of works. So what is interesting in this uh, commission is that he doesn't follow any particular classical text nor any uh, particular iconographic tradition. Uh, we'll see that he is replaced, definitely he is seen the works or heard of the works of uh, Mantegna in Mantua with the, uh, bed, the nuptial, nuptial uh, room in the Palazzo uh, of the Duke of Mantua. And uh, the, he's not doing the same thing, but he's definitely the inspiration of all these, what looks like little niches in Grisaille are in fact totally flat. It's, it's a, a trompe l'oeil. It gives you the feeling that these are uh, encased in the wall, but it is absolutely flat. And then the rest is kind of mimicking a trellis. Here is a picture from uh, the bottom of the, the uh, ceiling. 
So very much uh, that in imitation of marble architecture and uh, that trellis of vine that really gives a structure to the uh, invention. The only thread that we can follow in the decoration story is related to the myth of uh, Diana uh, by alluding to the story of Acteon. Uh, we'll see that in the fact a little putty is holding here the head of a stag. And this gives us right away that clue of what's happening. The story of Acteon, Acteon was a, a, a hero. He was a herdsman uh, and uh, was at the time in the forest when he by pure accident uh, came onto uh, Diana bathing. And uh, the goddess was very unhappy about that and transformed him into a stag that directly became attacked by his own uh, dogs, the, her the, the hunting dogs that were with him. And so they uh, rushed on the stag and pulled it apart. And all the putty is showing is the, the, the head of the poor Acteon uh, slash uh, stag's head. And here is the view of the three graces. Here we have an image of the three graces. Very interesting story when you think of a nun. Of course, Diana was also a, a, a virgin goddess. So this we can uh, imagine would be a parallel to a nun. But the three graces with all their nudity seems to us kind of strange with our present uh, view of a nudity with a Victorian look at it. Uh, but it's absolutely a delightful room and I wouldn't mind sleeping in there. He then uh, went on and uh, we find uh, regularly he gets a lot of religious works. Um, at first still quite uh, impregnated by the Mantegna or even prior to that, uh, to uh, the school of Ferrara. Here we have the Virgin and Child that are enthroned. On the left is our Saint Francis and Saint Anthony of Padua. And then on the other side, we have uh, John the Baptist. And I'm not sure who uh, that saint is. It's often it is uh, a saint, a local saint, and we cannot always identify it. As you can see, there is a lot more movement if you compare it to the pictures by the beautiful paintings by Bellini. It's, uh, the, this is much more uh, in motion, just that the torsion of uh, John the Baptist who is uh, showing Christ because he knows that he is the one who presents Christ to the population before Christ uh, starts his own um, destiny, if you want. And the, the beautiful pose of uh, St. Francis showing his stigmata. He didn't paint many portraits, but this is a, a wonderful portrait. Not sure of who the subject is. Um, some people believe that it would be Lucrezia Borgia or Salome because she's holding that uh, plate that is engraved. But actually, uh, they think that the, the better interpretation is that she is uh, the poet, Veronica Gambara, who ruled the principality of Correggio after the death of her husband. The laurel tree symbolizes the model, uh, the model's poetic gifts. And the ivy indicates her married, in this case, widowed status. Uh, within the uh, edge of the ball uh, are the words in Greek letters, nepenthes, which means a medicine for sorrow, which would be directly linked to the fact that the sitter is a poet. But it's a beautiful uh, portrait. In a sense, we can relate to what we have seen with the court portraits, these beautiful costume, huge sleeves. Uh, the shoulders, the beautiful round shoulders, and then the landscape in the back that really opens the vista for the uh, beholder.
This work was commissioned by the Duke of Mantua, Ferdinando Gonzaga, who gave it to the Grand Duke Cosimo II of Medici as a present in 1617, so almost a year, a uh, century later. Directly, that canvas was put in the Uffizi uh, Tribune next to all the best masterwork of the Medici collection. What we can see and becomes really a, one of the characteristic of Correggio is the light, that beautiful light emanating from baby Jesus uh, and the very expressive gesture of Mary, uh, the kind of sentimental and devotional uh, taste is going to be literally developed by Baroque painters. And of course, always the beautiful vista in the surrounding of uh, classical architecture. The next painting here was commissioned in around 1520 by a jurist, Francesco Munari, who was a very affluent jurist and a man of great culture. He wanted this for his family chapel of the Immaculate Conception in the Church of St. Francis in Correggio. Uh, so the, the whole story of this is a little known a uh, miraculous episode that is narrated into the ap apocryphal gospel of pseudo Matthew. The uh, couple of Joseph and Mary with Jesus stopped to rest under a date palm. And uh, seeing that it was full of fruits, she asked Joseph to pick some, but the fruits were much too high. And so uh, Joseph replied that they should rather think about finding some water and a source. Jesus then asked the palm to bend its branches so they, they could refresh themselves with the fruits. And at its roots, there appeared a spring of clear water. So there is the miracle. And this is really the moment where you can see Joseph is holding the branch and offer Jesus some fruits. But this, what is wonderful with Correggio is to have that sense of intimacy that you find really where often Joseph is put at the back and not a participant. Here he's a fully uh, interactive figure within the painting. And if you look at the way the, the, uh, the gazes are going, Jesus is looking at us and Mary is looking down towards St. Francis. Now, why is St. Francis there? He obviously wasn't alive at the time of Jesus, but we have to remember that the patron saint was, uh, first name was Francesco. So uh, this definitely shows St. Francis being the patron saint of the patron. And uh, therefore he's included in the, the work. Here we can really see how courageous style is starting to merge the beautiful expression that you find in Leonardo's painting with the a great variety of uh, sense of affection that you find in Raphael. And um, this is exactly what happens with Correggio. He kind of merges uh, different, sorry, whatever, it jumped to the next painting. So let's talk about the next painting. This is the Virgin and Child with an Angel, also known as the Madonna del Latte uh, by Correggio, where indeed you see uh, the child that is just being distracted by John the Baptist, but uh, was obviously um, getting the milk from his mother, was nursing. This painting was incredibly popular in, for several centuries. And so many, many versions were painted and engravings were made and copies that have survived. But it seems that this painting, which is at the extraordinary museum in Budapest, um, is the original one. And this is, can be detected by just the softness of the, the touch of Correggio on the surface. By the way, it looks like the painting has darkened a lot with age and we know that uh, definitely happens uh, because uh, the darkening of the, the varnish most of the time, not so much the, 
the pigment, but the varnish that's put on it. And that museum, unfortunately, doesn't have an enormous uh, amount of money. And so a lot of the paintings stored in that museum needs cleaning. But uh, behind there is supposed to be a pretty landscape that can be seen in some of the reproduction, later reproduction. Here is a view and you can see how incredibly soft the contours are and the particular uh, standard of beauty that is so typical to Correggio. You know, each painter has a sense of what is the most beautiful woman in his life and, and they, they are uh, pretty similar to one another as far as the, the standard for him of aesthetic. In this painting, Correggio turns to the, 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 the theme of the Holy Family. Uh, you can see uh, uh, Mary, with, who has her working basket next to her, is trying to put on a little jacket on Jesus, uh, who is kind of wiggling on her laps. Uh, the, she has just made that little jacket. And you see that incredible tenderness emanating from her. And the baby with the real character of a baby, a leg up and then the, the, trying to uh, move his arms, though he manages to show a sign of blessing, which of course shows that he's the, the Christ, the future Christ. In the background, we see Joseph in the, they have a really little cabana, but it's backing up on beautiful antique uh, ruins. Uh, Joseph is working hard. I think this painting shows really well that kind of uh, gradual transition from shadow, shadow to light that he had learned from Leonardo's uh, Milanese work. But he brings in, on top of the, the softness of Leonardo, he brings in also the beautiful soft coloring of Venetian works. The, sorry, uh, here again, we have, I want to reemphasize that uh, Correggio was never tempted by Rome nor by Florence, not even Venice. He was influenced by all of them, but didn't, uh, didn't go and work in these great centers. Uh, but definitely he became one of the most instrumental influences on 17th century Baroque painting. In this work, we have, uh, for example, very much that uh, diagonal line that will become so typical of uh, um, the Baroque painting, so <coughs> the 17th century works. And of course, a di diagonal line in, to the contrary of a pyramidal construction that you find typically with Leonardo and Raphael, uh, the diagonal line provides a much uh, bigger energy if you want, really require, is a waiting for something to happen. <coughs> so this shows the Noli Mitangere, uh, uh, where Christ uh, meets uh, Mary Magdalene at the tomb, but she wants to touch him and he says, no, you cannot touch me anymore. Another of his uh, beautiful works, the uh, mystic marriage of St. Catherine. And we see here how both Mary, uh, Mary's holding the hand of Catherine and Jesus is putting the ring on her hand. Again, incredible softness, beautiful coloring that is not fully saturated, but, but is really uh, more staying within the ochre tones and then a splendid landscape in the background. He is going to do something that a few of uh, the painter of that time will do, but is going to become uh, something of a demand for, for this, is a whole series of uh, paintings on mytholo mythological subjects. And these are really going to anticipate these 
boudoir decorations of the 18th century. So jumping literally two centuries over. Uh, again, ravishing little pictures uh, that really contrast in a sense, but are in the same vein as the religious paintings we saw before. This, were, this series of work were commissioned by the Duke of Mantua, Federico uh, II of Gonzaga, and uh, was part of a series uh, portraying Jupiter's loves, uh, probably destined to something we'll see in a minute, which is the um, Palazzo Te of Mantua, and particularly into the Ovid Hall, uh, because it, of course, refers to uh, some of the Ovid's writing. The painting, just to give you an idea of how a painting can go uh, from one hand to another, after Federico's death, it went to Spain. And then uh, it's mentioned in 1585 in Milan, part of a sculptor's collection. His um, son, Pompeo Leone, who actually worked in Spain for uh, the, for Philip II, uh, sold it to the Emperor Rudolf II, so it went to Prague, and then um, joined some others that we'll see later on. And then it was brought from Prague to Stockholm as a war booty by King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden and his daughter, the famous Queen Christina, after she abdicated, pro brought back the canvas with her to Rome. And after her death, it was inherited by an Italian cardinal who um, then um, sold it to uh, the Duke of Bracciano. And from there, it went to the collection of the French regent Philippe II of Orleans. It did go from there to a collection of the Duke of Bridgewater and then finally acquired by Camilo Borghese and came back to the Louvre. So can you imagine the, how, the, the story of one painting? So what it shows, of course, is Venus and Cupid with a satyr. Uh, we know that uh, Cupid is uh, in love with, sorry, uh, with uh, Venus and here he's uh, trying to uh, trying to seduce the goddess. Beautiful uh, interpretation of the, the skin, the, the whiteness of the skin, of course, at that time, women had, uh, should not be in the sun ever. And you can see the difference of color between the male and the female, where the male is always shown a little more tan. Then you have all the works of the bed sheets and then the drapery surrounding the bed and then the open vista. Uh, to the beautiful landscape on the left. This one is, sorry, is Venus and Cupid with a satyr. The other one uh, was the, uh, probably Danae. This was, of course, yes. I'm sorry for that, but I made a mistake in the, so the previous one is Danae showing uh, being impregnated by the golden shower. In this case, Venus and Cupid with a satyr. Um, it's probably the companion piece of what we'll see, the education of Cupid. Uh, we see here the uh, satyr who is uh, having a a really nice look at the uncovered Venus who is sleeping on the ground. She represents the terrestrial uh, Venus of carnal passion. Now, really interesting how we can uh, sometimes trace some paintings. Here in that uh, painting by Van Acht, who was the painter to uh, van der Geest in um, Antwerp. He shows here the beautiful gallery of van der Geest who was an art dealer. And there, let me move this to the other side so you can see it properly, is the painting by Correggio that is offered uh, into the gallery to the Antwerp collectors. These paintings of galleries are always so interesting to scholars because they can trace uh, the existing paintings.
the education of Cupid uh, shows uh, Hermes uh, with his uh, famous hat and uh, how they are uh, telling Cupid uh, stories of life, literally. So we have these, again, that very softness of uh, typical of Correggio and onto the skin and the way that the contours kind of fade away within the landscape. My favorite comes here with, if I can get, uh, of Jupiter and Io. And to me, this one is, every time I look at it, I discover something new. The story, of course, is that uh, Jupiter, who always has to transform himself because he doesn't want to, to scare his preys, is transforming himself as a cloud. And you see that ominous cloud. And when you look really well, you see a face ready to kiss, Eo. And then you have part of the cloud that turns into a kind of a paw uh, to hold her. It's, it's incredibly sensuous and uh, absolutely beautiful in, in uh, the, the way that Correggio has, has mastered these very different type of texture. Now, this was probably to be paired with uh, Ganymede. And here we have the young shepherd who is uh, raptured by an eagle, of course, eagle being the symbol of Jupiter and to become his, that young shepherd that is uh, Jupiter really liked and takes up to, uh, to the heavens, to, to the Olympia, uh, so that he can become the bearer of uh, wine. And he's, uh, this is, really quite a story telling about, in a sense, a kind of a bisexuality attributed to uh, Jupiter. And the final, uh, final one is uh, laid out with the swan. It's also uh, incredibly beautiful. Uh, the story goes that it was uh, so erotic that when the painting uh, ended up with the uh, red regent uh, of France, uh, his son was so angry at the sensuality that he cut off the head of Leda. And um, so Leda had to be uh, repainted, the painting had to be restored by a contemporary painter, so in the uh, 18th century. So the head itself is not by Correggio anymore, probably close to, uh, but again, a, a ravishing landscape with beautiful trees. In a sense, the nature there is very Flemish. So you, you know that uh, Correggio being in the north, uh, is going to have an influence, uh, be influenced by Flemish uh, landscapes and uh, some of the texture that are shown, so typical of the of uh, Flemish culture at that time. So what we see, in fact, is Leda playing in the stream with her maiden. And then she uh, received the embrace of the swan god, who is Jupiter, of course. So let's look at uh, leaving Correggio uh, there, and I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I, I do. Uh, but let's look at Florence, because Florence by that time is under the ruling of Cosimo I. By uh, 1530, we had the, the end of the last expulsion of the Medici from Florence. And in 1530, we see the reinstatement with the help of the Pope, who is himself a Medici, uh, of the, the dynasty. As also, it goes with the political support of the Emperor Charles V. Uh, in 1537, we have the Battle of Monte Murlo, uh, where the newly installed Duke Cosimo uh, the first uh, will the defeat a, 
an army that wanted to overthrow the Medici. And this is really going to settle him in. So by 1537, Cosimo becomes Duke of Florence. And this is the end of the Republic. 1569, he will even become Grand Duke of Tuscany. And Michelangelo, very angry with what's happening to his native city, uh, is decided to once for all to leave Florence and he goes on a self-imposed exile to Rome. So now that we're going to, we are approaching um, mannerism, I want to define it a little bit, though there's a lot of discussion by scholars. What is mannerism? Is it really a style? Uh, so at the time, it was considered as a natural progression uh, from the high Renaissance, a reaction to the classicism of Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael. It's so typical. This is part of the way life is. The children react to the way the parents are, and they want their own individuality. Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael had brought art to such a pinnacle that it was very difficult for painters to go on in the same direction. So it makes sense that they will react to it and try to come with something new. The term itself comes from Italian maniera, which means the manner or style. But it didn't come just by itself. It's not only a reaction to the three big names, but it happened alongside a number of other social, scientific, religious, and political movements, such as the Copernican model, big things and suddenly uh, there is that discovery that in fact the, the earth that the the um the asters and so don't turn around the, the 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 earth but that in fact the earth turns around the the sun this terrible sack of rome in 1527 really scared incredibly uh you know, definitely artists, but also the population. And couldn't believe that Rome, the most important city, uh, could have been looted so badly by the soldiers. And then we also have, don't forget, the Protestant Reformation in 1519, which is not going to affect the Italians uh, or barely at all, though there are some people that are very much in the margins. Um, but it still shakes uh, the known world because of uh, what's happening and that final separation between people that were reacting against the Catholic Church. As far as style is concerned, uh, mannerism is anti-classical with elongated forms, exaggerated uh, elongated forms, We'll see some of them have really precariously balanced poses. The perspective that was so important during the early Renaissance and definitely in the high Renaissance becomes collapsed. So we have pretty shallow uh, or undefined uh, composition. Irrational settings. Sometimes we really don't know exactly what the artist is bringing together. And the uh, lightning is becoming very theatrical, which is going to lead to the Baroque period. It also is a mark of intellectual conceit and artistic virtuosity, where artists are not anymore looking at nature, but are looking at works of predecessors and trying to reinterpret them. So uh, two names as a kind of early influences in that way. One is Giuliano Romano. Giuliano Romano, and I'm going to take myself the other side again. Giuliano, Giuliano Romano uh, was one of the very faithful assistant um, to Raphael. If you remember the story when Raphael was called to Rome and received a tremendous amount of commission, he found there some artists that were in the process of painting the apartments of the, the Pope. And the Pope stopped everything and kicked everything, everybody out. But Raphael had very small workshop and needed people that were uh, knowledgeable in uh, fresco work and so on, uh, which she wasn't so much uh, familiar with but also he needed people that were familiar with 
Rome's climate. And at that time, uh, Rome was surrounded with marshes. So it was a very humid climate and demanding a different technique than, for example, fresco in um, Florence. So Giuliano Romano came up as a, a, one of the most trusted assistant of Raphael, where Raphael really admired what he was doing. And Raphael was known to get along with everybody. He never was superior or made people uh, feel uh, overwhelmed by Raphael. Or to the contrary, he was really trying to get them to work together. So Giulio uh, became a very, very uh, close assistant to Raphael. But after Raphael died in the uh, 20s, uh, he stayed and was hoping to kind of succeed to Raphael, but then came in 27, the sack of Rome, where Giulio left in a hurry, was able to get a job in Mantua, and particularly for the Palazzo T. The Palazzo del T that you see here was uh, originally a stud farm that belonged to the Marchesi of Gonzaga. By 1526 onward, the young Federico de Gonzaga uh, had the stalls converted to a large palazzo-like villa. It's slightly outside of Mantua, though now it is included in the city. But uh, he wanted to make it a place for pleasure and courtly entertainment, an island of leisure love and display of a ruler status. It took about 10 years to complete the, the palazzo. And um, uh, what happened is that Federico had spent as a child several years at the court of uh, Julius II in Rome, so had become familiar with the new art of the Renaissance and the Roman culture of the villas. From 1515 15 to 17, he had lived in France in the circle of uh, King Francis I who lived in various chateaux in the Loire Valley that, and was extremely receptive to the Renaissance. So when he decided to get the Palazzo del Te uh, re rehabbed, if we can say, he really wanted to uh, do it in that fashion as what he had seen in Rome and in France. But he is going to hand not only the design of the architecture and the decoration, uh, to the hands of a single artist, Giulio Romano. And uh, so what uh, Giulio did is use this, just a single story uh, Roman house with a vestibule and a very large atrium that you see here. Uh, beautiful land all around. And then of course you had the, the buildings for the servants and the horses. So what Giulio is going to do is put together a huge workshop and do exactly the same thing as Raphael had done and try to have all these great, pretty good level artists work together, try to uh, work in a similar fashion so that you don't have a difference in the styles and work efficiently so that this uh, whole thing would be done within the 10 years. Sorry, but the mouse doesn't want to work properly. Yeah. This is another view, so as it's seen from the back of the palace towards the arcade that you see behind. But uh, there are multiple rooms within the palace that have been completely worked out. The first one that was done, don't forget, this was a stud farm. And so this is a direct uh, recollection of, of its original used and this is the Salone dei Cavalli uh, where you can see the uh, most beautiful horses that were bred in the farm uh, shown in this incredibly realistic way where you have the feeling they're going to jump out of the frame. This is one of the first one that was completed in 1526 and uh, was used for uh, banquets or dances. The, low, the bottom part of the, the walls uh, were decorated with the leather hangings.
the, the high quality of the horses uh, would meant would say that normally Giulio Romano himself would have painted them. And then of course you have the beautiful coffered ceiling. Another room is the Sala di Psyche, the, C the CK, if you want. So the, the room of Psyche, uh, the, the famous uh, Psyche who made uh, Cupid fall in love with her uh, was one of, of course, the very um, sophisticated personality that you find in the mythology that's been studied thoroughly because it represents all the different aspects of our psyche, as we call it, uh, for ourselves. Uh, and so <coughs> you have different themes in the ceiling and on the walls uh, with scenes of banquets and uh, different other works. So this room was intended for entertaining. Famous banquet was held there in 1530 in honor of the Emperor Charles V <clears throat> during his first uh, visit to Mantua. It is actually at that time that uh, the Marquis Federico uh, Gonzaga was elevated to the rank of Duke. So the story in the room illustrates Apuleius' uh, story of the golden ass, that antique story that recounts Psyche's romantic adventures and the trials she endured in order to be allowed to marry Cupid. Just to give you one idea, here is the uh, banquet uh, where you can see uh, people are uh, looking at extraordinary uh, golden works and then you have animals of all kinds all around. Uh, scenes of love here you have uh, the very heavy uh, supporter of Dionysus and then here on the other side uh, you have a beautiful view of Apollo. So a whole series of uh, myths next to, to one another. Here's the tribute to Apollo for example and then you have behind elephants and all kind of other uh, exotic animals. This is supposed to be a giraffe. And here people coming from uh, with with food to be offered to the to the banquet. A feast for the gods. The ceiling itself is also just a series of cameos of different uh, episodes of uh, the trials of uh, Psyche. Incredibly rich. Mantua is a, a small, it's not really a city, it's a town that is often overlooked when you travel through uh, Italy and it should really be a, a stop because not only you have the Palazzo del Te, but you have uh, within Mantua itself the beautiful San Andrea church designed by um, Alberti and uh, then the Palazzo Ducale uh, with the, the, the famous room by Mantegna and many other uh, incredible treasures. Apparently the only problem, not, no good hotel. So you have to stay in the next big town, which would be Verona, by the way. Uh, another room is La Sala dei Giganti, so the room of the giants that describes uh, describes the uh, apocalyptic catastrophe of the uh, giants being thrown off by Jupiter and uh, falling. You know they were revolting uh, and trying to become the, the head of Olympia, and it didn't work. So you see Jupiter there uh, sending them. Uh, falling and you have these enormous figures there uh, holding rocks and these tumultuous uh, clouds that are garnishing the, that uh, ceiling of the Sala dei Giganti. So the giants, as you know, are attacked by the god. Uh, they were trying to storm Olympus. <coughs> They're trying to pile mountain onto mountain until 
uh, finally, uh, Jupiter causes the boulder to fall with his lightning. And of course, when you see the detail of the giants, I think the next slide is going to show you the the ill proportion, the the huge. But that that's really the whole idea is that they grotesque compared to the perfection of the gods up above the Olympia. So uh, Giulio Romano is really he painted other things too, but he's really going to devote himself to the Palazzo del Te. The other great figure of the early mannerism is Andrea del Sarto. Uh, del Sarto means of the tailor. So he was born in Florence as Andrea Dagnolo di Francesco in 1486. And all these are about the same date. He visited Rome uh, where he was very much influenced by the monumentality of Michelangelo. By 1517, he married Lucrezia di Baccio del Feria, a wealthy widow, uh, and uh, went shortly after that, worked uh, for Francis I in France in 1518 and 19, and died in Florence in 1530. He was an excellent draftman and uh, was extremely uh, influential by, uh, for his pupil like Pontormo, who would see Rosso Fientorino that we'll see at the end because he really came, uh, became known when he went to work for Francis I in, in the, the Chateau of Fontainebleau. And then Vasari, Vasari, who was a typical Mannerist painter, but was also known particularly for uh, his famous lives of the most famous painters, sculptors, and architects of the Renaissance and became the champion of um, Michelangelo. So looking at Andrea de Sarto, we find some of that softness that we have seen in Caravaggio. Uh, this is the portrait of uh, the uh, artist's wife so that he married uh, in Florence. And uh, he is um, only, he, he had an incredible number of works, a great output. So I'm going to show you, try to, to have a choice of different things. This is uh, the Sermon of John the Baptist, part of frescoes in the uh, cloister de, de lo Scalzo in Florence. So this was an atrium and part of the atrium where these uh, grisaille, what we call grisaille, which means it's, they're all different shades of the same color. He worked there between 1509 and 26 with some interruption. The, the frieze depicts the, the uh, life of John the Baptist, uh, who is the patron saint of the brotherhood uh, of that, of that uh, monastery. And by the way, the use of grisaille was not a question of saving money, but was more uh, following the uh, rigor and humility of that uh, communal ideal of, so the renunciation of color uh, was a part of their desire. Here is another one, uh, the, baptism of the people. And you can see the absolutely magnificent design, I think, which comes even more in Griseide than when you have the colors that are distracting you. But I find that that central figure of Christ is beautifully designed. Uh, definitely by now, the anatomy research of Michelangelo have uh, influenced everybody around. So you have a very uh, precise, representation of the anatomy, but beautiful uh, movement, a uh, very natural movement of uh, that man who is undressing to be baptized by John the Baptist. One of his uh, early known work is, sorry, but my mouse is refusing to work properly, so. Here, the 
uh, Madonna of the Harpies uh, is a really first very interesting work, which is starting to demark uh, the Sarto from the, the very typical high Renaissance artist. Uh, more movement, more torsion that could have been brought by the early works of Michelangelo uh, that uh, broke with the very quiet and calm representation by Leonardo, for example. So this uh, work was supposed to depict the Madonna and child crowned by two angels uh, and flanked by St. John the Evangelist and St. Bonaventura. Uh, this changed because by the time uh, Andrea del Sarto painted it, it shows St. John the Evangelist indeed on the right, uh, but St. Francis on the other side. What is very interesting is that polygonal pedestal from which the Madonna takes its name because these are the harpies who were the guardian of the underworld. Um, and uh, this is in, an interesting intrusion of mythology within uh, Christianity. And this is very much a result of the work of humanists at that time who were trying to put, uh, make sense of these both very important part of culture, the Christian culture and the classical text uh, together. Now, uh, part of the in interpretation shows that in the book of Revelation, uh, they show the Virgin triumphant over evil symbolized by the monstrous figures, the harpies that are in fact the locust mentioned in Revelation. And beside that, bear witness of the cult of the Virgin by the, cl the clients who were conventional Franciscans, therefore the presence of uh, Francis. Bonaventura being a Franciscan too, and uh, one of the writers of uh, Francis um, biography. The Madonna and Child with St. Elizabeth, uh, the infant St. John and two angels, uh, is one of the paintings that was made for Francis I. The subject is, of course, the meeting of uh, St. Elizabeth and the infant St. John and the Virgin and her child. And Javier Sarto made uh, some uh, a portrait. This is one a really interesting one of the woman with a basket of spindles, very dignified but with great tenderness. Uh, it's beautiful uh, portrait, and we would we see there what um, Pontormo that we'll see later on uh, was taking from it. heavy use of chiaroscuro, which is going to become so typical of the Baroque period too. So other works, he made a series of frescoes for um, the Medici family, that these were uh, decorations that were celebrating the Pope's father, the Pope being uh, Leo X. Um, of uh, Lorenzo de Medici, and this is for the, fam the family's villas, Poggio a Cayano. Uh, the, story, the story is the uh, triumph of Caesar. We see Caesar here sitting on the, the step to the Senate, and then, of course, all kind of figures revolving around it of uh, everyday life. Virgin and Child in Glory with Six Saints uh, shows uh, the, again, that evolution of uh, Sarto away from the, the very quiet uh, composition of the High Renaissance. Though still is, this is still pyramidal, but you have a lot of torsions and a lot of different planes that um, move away from the High Renaissance. So uh, before we move to Potormo, I would like to you to come back. We'll take uh, between five and 10 minutes recess. 
uh, stretch your legs, get more, uh, get more coffee or water, and uh, come with questions if you have any. No question. Unmute yourself. Ken, I mean, my, yeah. uh, I have. Not, it's not a question, but I'm, I'm struggling to see the difference in this mannerism because for me, it seems to be just an extension of. Uh, the Renaissance. The... Yeah, but we we coming now with both Giulio Romano and um, and Andrea del Sarto. We see a slight movement away from the High Renaissance. What we're going to see when Pontormo, Bronzino, and so on will be a much starker uh, difference. And so okay. we will come to it, and you will see how much more elongated the shape become. And sometimes uh, some movements make no sense. And so that will become really the, the high mannerism, if we can call it. Uh, okay. 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 Cool. Um, this but is how, how do you like Correggio? Lovely. Oh, it's it is just incredible to me. Yeah. I love that uh, Jupiter and Io, that cloud, and how he makes that cloud turn into a, a person is incredible. But I think if I may say one thing, if I one thing that I think I find is in, interesting is that uh, today in modern society, Facebook is struggling with allowing a woman to show a woman breastfeeding. Yeah, <laughs> it was just natural. I mean, the, the relationship. It is. Is so it absolutely is. We have to distance ourselves from the Victorian period. You know, in the 18th century, that wasn't even questioned. And everything changed in the 19th century. Yeah. And we can't totally move away from it. Yeah. And there seems to be a very different emotional feeling. Especially yes. now the Del Sarto, the gazes are more intense. Very much. Less at ease. And um, there's always someone gazing at the viewer but um, there isn't that calm feeling of the Renaissance. No, and that's exactly it. And I'm that's why we, we put together, you see, we say that the times were, though the times during the High Renaissance were not easy, but here there are a lot more external problems and the religion, the fact that the religion was hit so, so strongly by the Reformation, uh, the sack of Rome, which absolutely terrorized people and thought, you know, Rome of all places to be looted the way it was, was it was incredible. So it was in a sense shaking all the fundamentals of, of society. And I think this is part of what happens. And then you had very high, uh, really an elite of intellectuals in Florence that were going at incredible levels. And these started some discussion and that was part of that evolution of painting too. But you're absolutely right. The, the gazes are much, much more powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's, with uh, Correggio, it's very soft. But I think with Correggio, you have already these movements, these diagonal lines that come in. And, uh, but I, I love, his sensuality, he's so sensual, even mm. with the virgin. I mean, if she wasn't the virgin, you would say, oh, wow, you know. It, it's uh, quite, quite interesting. Mm. But what we will see now with uh, Pontormo and, and others, you will see oh. very much when mannerism becomes bizarre at times. Mm -hmm. It's gonna produce some real masterpieces, but some of them, a lot of scholars had, had tremendous questions about it. I love that. Pontormo, I'm sure we'll see of the deposition. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, this yeah. is one of the best examples that you can have of the bizarre aspect of, of mannerism. I keep thinking about the Correggio, Lita and the Swan. Yes. That beautiful curve of the swan. Oh, incredible. That it's, neck. That it's, neck that comes. It's just in my mind. It's, it's hard to yeah, not that, picture it. It's very true. And uh, you will have 
I will soon give you, I checked and it looks like the school hasn't yet downloaded the, um, the recordings um, of uh, since uh, January. So I'm gonna go back at them and ask them to do it. But you will have soon, this week it's gonna be a little quieter for me. So you will have soon the uh, PowerPoint. So you can go back to the images. Okay, I think we're going to start again, so I don't take you too late. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to mute you again, and we'll talk at the end. Okay, so um, one of the main students, in, for sure, uh, was successful students of Del Sarto is Jacopo Pontormo, who was born in Pontormo as Jacopo Carucci in 1494. He was probably apprenticed to Leonardo, but also Piero di Cosimo, and then finally uh, to Andrea Del Sarto. He was employed by the Medici for the villa in Poggio, was very much influenced by Prince of Durer, uh, and don't forget, Dürer came through Venice and did a, went a little further, but brought with him an enormous amount of prints uh, that he sold very well and uh, really was influential on many Northern painters. And he died in Florence uh, in 57. He was known as a neurotic character, melancholic and very introspective. So some of his early works, um, this uh, painting of Joseph being sold to Potiphar uh, belongs to a series of four paintings entitled Scenes from the Life of Joseph, the Hebrew, uh, that are, by the way, all now in the National Gallery in London. They were intended for the decoration of the nuptial chamber of Francesco Borgherini and Margherita Acciaoli, who were married in 1515, but then were dispersed after uh, their death. So here we, we can see uh, Joseph uh, being uh, sold to Potiphar. And then you have, you can, very typical, you, you had that kind of zigzag view towards the back. The young man is, is, as you can see, looking up. He is very young at the time uh, he meets Potiphar. The colors, as we've talked about in mannerism, are very different. You don't have the saturated colors of the high Renaissance, definitely not of the following with the Baroque. You have these more uh, in between kind of uh, uh, acid, acidic, I call them acidic colors. So the pinks and the blues are much more uh, are lighter and less, as I said, less saturated. Another of that series is uh, Joseph in Egypt, where we can see here Joseph introducing uh, his uh, family there and asking the, uh, the man that is here to uh, be able to live in uh, Egypt. Very interesting, again, composition. You have there quite a bit of diagonals, uh, a crowd that is uh, quite noisy, as you can see, little putties uh, that are going around, including that one on top of a column, who seems to mimic uh, the uh, movement of uh, some of the classical statues that are on uh, the very top. What we see here too is that there is no more uh, great interest in perspective. Uh, the subject is not really shown in a rational manner. Uh, the colors and the light uh, is, are used the way he feels. So it's a much more uh, personal feeling, a subjective way of representing. And he can borrow from any source he chooses. So uh, the only thing he needs to do is create an interesting design. So you have, in fact, four different plates. Here you have uh, Joseph presenting his family, 
uh, who is invite who invited to move to to Egypt to the Pharaoh. Uh, apparently, the boy that is sitting there would be Pontormo Young. Um, on the right, we have Joseph, who is sitting on a triumphal cart. Pulled by three putties. I'm trying to find. Oh, here it is. Sorry. And um, wrapped in a piece of cloth, blown by the wind. Appear, and then so we have the, 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 the little putty up there. And so you have all kind of little cameos of stories that don't especially make sense to our uh, contemporary uh, ways. So let's look at the difference between Pontormo and Andrea del Sarto. Here is what we've seen before, the Madonna of the Harpies, who is already kind of moving away from the uh, high Renaissance. And here is the Pontormo Madonna, Madonna and Child with Saints, uh, only painted a year after del Sarto, but you can see a completely different style uh, that is, uh, arising from the uh, manners, much more elongated lines, uh, different expressions, much more bizarre to so why is uh, Jesus laughing that way? Uh, people are looking at the place we're not sure. So we don't know for uh, where it was originally supposed to be that there might have been a painting on the, the left that would have attracted the gaze of many people. Uh, some position that are not part of the uh, classical vocabulary. So that starts to show that difference of uh, objective from Pantormo uh, and Andrea del Sarto. <clears throat> Pantormo was asked to paint uh, many places. This is in the fa famous Villa Medici, uh, the Medici at the Poggia Acaia, Acaiano. So this is the interior and you have that beautiful uh, lunette under the, the coffered ceiling with a figure of uh, Liber, the Roman god of fertility. And then you have personification of winter and autumn. So we have a skinny dog and here we have the uh, personification of winter and autumn. And this is really interesting because you have some expression, just the grumpy uh, face of, of the doggy, almost ready to bark. It's, it's kind of one of these unusual details of frescoes that we will find again and again in um, Pantomo's work. As um, Joan was mentioning, this is one of uh, the most uh, mannerist work by Pontormo. It's part of the uh, Caponi Chapel. Uh, and here is that famous deposition in the Caponi Chapel. So you can see how the color scheme has completely changed. We have pinks and blues and yellows. And then really, a really strange feeling. The way that angel is holding Jesus, the way this one is squatting to hold the, the legs of Jesus, which would not be possible if you think of the weight of a human being, um, doesn't make much sense. The use apparently were uh, inspired by the Sistine Chapel, but the representation is not clear at all. Uh, you have a very large virgin here, a very pale Christ. Christ's uh, left hand and uh, legs are disproportionate compared to the proportion and the extremity of the virgin. And this is uh, really strange when you see the, the figures that are around. They don't interact logically. Lots of Torsion of faces, uh, expression that are really uh, overwhelming, I would say. But uh, compare this, for example, with Raphael, the entombment of Raphael that was painted 
21 years before, where you have a much more a rational way of representation, uh, where the movement and the, the uh, muscular reaction of the two main figures they carrying the, the body of Christ makes sense. And people around are interacting in a, in a natural way. And you see here something completely irrational. There is so much ambiguity that we will see repeated in many of the works by the uh, Mannerist. Here's another work by uh, Pontormo, The Visitation. And you can see the, the elongation of the forms, uh, strange expression of the feet, I would say almost the, the toes uh, that are really bizarre. And these expression of the two figures looking at us the color scheme is very different, though this is prior, the, the cleaning, and now look at the difference. Once the painting was clean, how different the color scheme is, which is very bright, but uh, again, as I say, not saturated colors, very acid. They look like candies. So they are shown here that they literally frozen in the middle of that architecture. And I would say out of proportion, if you think of that little figure that you see in the background, it doesn't work with the, the normal uh, perspective. So they don't care about it anymore. Many works by Pontormo have been, have disappeared, so right here. Yeah. Uh, they all have been uh, damaged. And one probably the most tragic is the loss of uh, some unfinished frescoes for the choir of the Basilica of San Lorenzo in Florence, uh, at which he really tried to, to uh, spend most of his work at the end of his life. Uh, the fresco depicted the last judgment. And again, you have these really uh, figures that are the figure of Christ here is surrounded by other figures in very strong torsion. And to go against the tradition, it's really interesting to see that God the Father is below Christ, which is something that theologically would never have been shown that way. So he goes against any pictorial and theological tradition. Vasari even wrote about it because he was disturbed. So he said, but I, I have never been able to understand the significance of this scene. Although I know that Jacopo had wit enough for himself and also associated with learned and lettered, pers and lettered person. I mean what he could have intended to signify in that part where there is Christ on high raising the dead and below his feet is God the Father who is creating Adam and Eve. So here you have Adam and Eve being created by God. So really, again, it's, it's a very much part of that intellectual uh, milieu that we find there. Part of the same uh, fresco is a drawing here that were preparation for the fresco of the choir. Uh, showing here the group of the dead, and you have the mingling of bodies that makes it incredibly modern. Uh, if you look at it, you can find that kind of images with uh, some of the turn of the century of the 19th to 20th century, even Blake or whatever, you can find some of that in, uh, in this preparation drawing. He did some portrait for which is uh, very famous. I just brought uh, a few. This is Maria Salviati with Giulia de Medici. She was the wife of the famous military leader Giovanni delle Bandenere de Medici. And um, the little one, the Giulia, was a Medici relative who was left in her care after the murder, murder of uh, the child's father. 
So here, as you can see, he obviously was esteemed. What is to me the most beautiful are probably the hands. The hands, one holding a medal and the other one holding the hand of the little girl who seems really scared by what's happening. Now, you can notice that there are some, some uh, African features in the face of the little girl. So, uh, Alessandro, the, the father of the little girl, uh, was born of a liaison between a Medici cardinal and a servant who, tradition has it, was African. And so this would be the first of a girl of African ancestry in European art. And then you might remember some years ago, uh, the Getty uh, purchased this Pontomo, the Francesco Guardi is an Albertier. Uh, that was quite a coup when uh, the Getty got this painting, I remember it vividly. And so here you have the Albertier whose intent is to guarding the defensive rampart that is painted in the background, you cannot uh, see it too well. Definitely the painting has been clean. And so you, you have the beautiful tone of red, uh, orange red, that uh, really brings the painting to, to life. So another known name of mannerist is Agnolo, Agnolo Bronzino, who was also born in Florence. Uh, as Agnolo di Cosimo was born in 1503, died in 1572. He was a pupil and adopted son of Pontormo and became court painter to the Duke Cosimo de' Medici. Um, in 1563, he became one of the founder members of the Accademia del Disegno and died in Florence in 1572, his main pupil an adopted son was Alessandro Allori, uh, who will uh, become the transition between the Renaissance and the Baroque. A known painter for portraits, this is a wonderful portrait of a lady in red. Uh, some people attribute it to Pontormo, this, that transition period where you can find, uh, where it's difficult to define who was the painter. Um, it's really brilliant. And you have that amazing contrast between the red and the black of the sleeves. It shows that the young lady is uh, an avid reader, as there are some books behind the seat uh, that uh, show some books. And then, of course, the delightful little doggy on her laps. The most known of uh, the portrait by Bronzino is Eleonora of Toledo with her son Giovanni de' Medici. Um, she was the daughter of the Viceroys of Naples, Don Pedro di Toledo, and married Cosimo de' Medici in 1539 and died in, six, in 1562. This portrait is around 14, uh, 1545, about uh, where she's portrayed with one of their eight sons, the young John born in 1543 and died uh, as his mother of malaria in 62. A very beautiful blue in the background that uh, brings up the, the magnificent brocard dress of Eleonora. It, this is one of my favorite um, portraits. The big difference with Andrea del Sarto is the hand. I think del Sarto would have made a much more articulated hand there resting on the, the laps. By the way, uh, she was probably wearing that dress uh, in her tomb because they found some fragment of the dress when they opened the tomb. A known, uh, again, very mannerist painting is the, sorry, is the allegory with Venus and Cupid. Uh, Cupid comes back uh, all the time. This was uh, probably presented to uh, Francis, King of France. 
Um, and it was really designed as a puzzle because it incorporates a whole series of symbols and devices from the world of mythology and very emblematic figures. Uh, so the, as we know the name, you know, the taste of Francis I who delighted in mythology and was known for his lusty appetite. This was a, a perfect gift to him, a lot of nudity and pretty people. So we have Venus in the center, goddess of love and beauty. She is identified by the golden name apple that was of course given to her by Paris and by her doves uh, that are here at the feet. And so we see Cupid ready to kiss her. It's a very sensual uh, moment. You have at her feet some masks, but uh, maybe the symbols of sensual nymph and satyr that seem to gaze up, as you can see the mask down here, gaze up at the lovers. The playful child that you see here is playfulness. Behind him is time and fraud. So fraud, of course, uh, that's um, fair of face, but foul of body. And you can see that the body is really bizarre with the tail of a, of a snake. And, uh, and then time always represented by an older, older man. Across from there is oblivion. Um, of course, it has to do <laughs> with um, mortal, you know, human love. And then Morpo Gallico, which would mean the, uh, the which is actually called the French uh, disease, which in fact is syphilis. This was introduced to Europe from the New World and reached epidemic proportion by 1500. So the symbolic meaning of the central scene is supposed to be unchaste love, presided over by pleasure, abetted by deceit, and the painful consequences, oblivion and uh, disease. Of course, as painter to Cosimo, he is going to be asked to paint a portrait. This is one of the many portraits of Cosimo the first. That portrait uh, would have been diffused throughout Tuscany. Uh, actually, we'll see in a minute a, a statue that was made that uh, is very much a pendant, if you want, to that painting. The military breastplate, uh, just like a Roman emperor and military leader. And then on the right shoulder, you have the Marzocco, uh, which is the uh, roaring lion, which is the emblem of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Florence. He is about 25 years old when he's portrayed this, <coughs> and is obviously pointing to his political and ability and, and power. Now, very interesting is the portrait here of Andrea Doria as Neptune. Uh, it, it's almost comical when you think about it. Uh, Do Andrea Doria was a Genoese condottiere who commanded the combined fleets of Venice, the Pope and the Emperor in their victory over the Turks. Uh, so this is pretty much a, a significant example of Bronzino's work as a pro um, portraitist of the aristocracy. Uh, the, we shouldn't be shocked by the, uh, the paws as well as the, the clothing of uh, Andrea Doria because often they wanted to allude to their ancient lineage. And so um, this is going back to uh, Neptune and the marine god. Now, quite interesting if you compare the same uh, man, Andrea Doria, 
painted by another um, Mannerist painter, Sebastiano del Piombo, on the left, uh, but where you see all the uh, image of his uh, coat of arms uh, shown below. Also, to show you uh, that it's not the only time, by Baccio Bandinelli is the statue of the giant, which is supposed to represent Andrea Doria also uh, in Carrara, uh, but shown also half nude, uh, but um, a man of the sea. He was an incredible dominant figure in Genoa. So moving to the later part of the Mannerist movement, we keep the same three important figures there. And we'll sh show a few examples of Parmigianino, uh, Benvenuto Cellini, the sculptor, Giorgio Vasari, the historian, but also painter, Gian Bologna, the sculptor, and then the two, Rosso Fiorentino and Primaticcio, who went to work for Francis I, in particularly in Fontainebleau. So to start with Parmigianino, who was an absolutely wonderful painter and draftsman, unfortunately didn't live very long, died at the age of 37. He was born in Parma in 1503, raised by his uncles because his parents died. There were eight children and they were all raised by their uncles, Michele and Pierre Hilario. He worked in San Giovanni in Parma and there met Correggio. He traveled to Rome where he was literally, he came in 1524 and uh, shortly after the death of Raphael and was celebrated as a Raphael reborn. Unfortunately, by 1527, he had to flee Rome and lost everything in the process. Uh, resided in Bologna for nearly three years in 1528, and then uh, was known to be a devotee of alchemy and fascinated by magic. But this can be explained that he did many uh, etchings and was trying to find a new process uh, in etching, uh, easier than what was used at that time, and died of a fever in Casal Maggiore in 1540. He is an absolutely delightful painter. Uh, he is Parmigianino in Diana and Actel. Uh, that was a small room in the castle of Fontanellato uh, that was, um, that tells the story uh, told by Ovid of the hunter Acteon again. We had uh, the same thing as we had in the nunnery. Uh, so a different uh, story about Acteon and Artemis slash Diana, and the fact that poor Acteon is going to end up dead because of the accidental uh, encounter with Artemis. When Parmigianino decides to go to Rome, he's going to have a whole series of small paintings that he wants to present to the Pope and to the, the, the court. Uh, and he's going to be very clever and offer it to the Pope. One of the most astounding is this self-portrait of a very handsome, as you can see, young man. Uh, this is a self-portrait in a convex mirror. And um, this is really interesting because he's using a barber's convex glass and then decides to paint what he sees, including a hand at the front that is much larger because of the, the, the shape of the, the lens. Uh, but then his face in the center, and then you can see the distortion of the window on the side. So this is, was something very new uh, that was extremely attractive to the collectors. And so uh, when it was offered to uh, the Pope, the Pope was uh, extremely uh, happy. He's a portraitist as well as he did a wonderful religious painting. This is the portrait of Galeazzo San Vitale uh, that was a, a, an aristocrat from Parma. Uh, he was actually the ruler of Parma for a while. 
Count of Fontanellato. And so he shows the Count with many of the attributes uh, of what his profession and his power. In the right hand, he displays a bronze medal uh, marked with a mysterious cipher, seven and two. So it must have had a significance for him, but nobody knows nowadays. The vision of St. Jerome, and here we see that uh, uh, different composition due to that, that mannerist movement with uh, some strange uh, perspective there that doesn't correspond to uh, what the Virgin is above. So we have that foreshortening, it doesn't make a lot of sense, that very strong torsion of John the Baptist down below. Uh, and seems apparently to be a vision of Saint Jerome who is sleeping on the ground. And he has the vision of Mary and Jesus and uh, John the Baptist. This was commissioned uh, for the family chapel at Saint Salvatore in Lauro in Rome by Maria Buffalini. The most known painting and the most uh, scriptic painting, I must say, by Parmigianino is the Madonna de, dal Colo Longo. So the Madonna with the long neck uh, that shows that really interesting figure of the Virgin and huge, huge representation. If she had to stand, she would go through the ceiling and on her laps, is a very large baby Jesus, but who is already uh, in the position that anticipates his crucifixion. And in fact, in the reflection of that vase held by that angel on the side, you can see a crucifixion, uh, which is a reflection of the baby on the surface. So a lot of uh, symbolism in these, uh, but not a particular regard to proportions. We have a column at the back that could be explained by the, uh, the sentence that, uh, that is um, related to Mary of the column to um, ut columna, that you have a neck like a column. And at the foot of the column is an image of Saint Jerome, uh, who is uh, holding a scroll. And unfortunately, this is one of the last painting by Parmigianino. Only the feet next to him, let us believe that he's talking to St. Francis. Um, I don't know how they can identify it, but apparently this is the way uh, that it was typical. And so you have these very unusual proportion figures and the colors that are much more typical of mannerism. This again, we have to keep in mind was unfinished because of the death, unexpected death of Parmigianino. So they would have been a, a more finished background. Other very interesting uh, figures of the Manrese period is Benvenuto Cellini. And if ever you have a chance to read his biography or see there was a movie on him, I don't remember the name of it, but it was hilarious. Quite a, a, a strong personality. He was a sculptor, goldsmith and metal worker. Uh, his autobiography was written in, a, as they say, racy vernacular, um, was only published in 1728. Um, he was born in Florence in 1500. Uh, he worked for the papal court between 1529 and 40. Worked for, sorry, not for, but for Francis I in 1540 to 45. And then worked for Cosimo de' Medici and died in Florence in 1571. He was definitely one of the most important mannerist sculptor. Uh, and as I mentioned, first publication of his autobiography was in 1728. So just a few examples of his works. This is a very early work, uh, the medallion with Leda and the Swan. That was uh, 
executed for the gonfaloniere sorry, of Rome that he was supposed to wear on a hat. I would take it any time. He was, he made also, he minted some uh, medals. This is a medal of Clement VII. So this was to try to regain the favor of the poor, which was lost due to disagreement. Cellini was known to have a terrible character. So no surprise that he would have had some problem. So you have on uh, one side Moses here, and on the other, um, a female impersonating peace. When he worked for Francis, he did a beautiful medal of uh, his profile, known for his long nose, as we know. And again, some of his uh, most known work, done for Francis, by the way, is the famous salt cellar that is at the Consistorius Museum in Vienna. This absolutely extraordinary. So this is about 33 centim centimeters in long, in length, which is about this uh, long. Um, it's part enamel and gold. It was completed in 1543. And these, they, they, to come to that point, he was preparing models that, that he had started preparing many years earlier. This is the only remaining work of a precious metal that can be attributed to, to Cellini. Um, but the cell is just extraordinary. So all the colors that you see are enamel colors. You see the two uh, gods that are uh, facing one another, uh, Neptune, of course, and then Venus on the other. So they represent the four times of day and the fourth chief wind that can be seen in uh, all the different uh, figures at the very bottom. The earth, he fashioned like a woman, And the sea is represented by a male figure. This is another profile, the other side, sorry. Oh, I have to do something to replace that. Yeah, here is another view of the same work. So you can see here the, um, the seahorses uh, coming out of the, the water and then the other figures over that temple. It's an absolutely magnificent work. Uh, there's though a little interesting um, point to this one is that on the 11th May, 2003, it was stolen from the Kunsthistorisches Museum, which at that time was covered by scaffolding. And so um, the thief set off the alarms, but they were ignored as false. And the theft remained undiscovered until 8.20 in the morning. So the museum offered a reward of a million euros for its recovery. And it was recovered on the 21st of January, 2006, buried in a lead box in a forest near the town of Svetel in Austria, about 90 kilometers uh, north of Vienna. The, the thief, Robert Mang, uh, turned himself in after the police released surveillance photos. Um, which were recognized by some of his acquaintance. Since then, the sculpture is insured for an estimated $60 million. Uh, also very known is his Perseus, which is in the Loggia dei Lanzi in Florence, next to the Palazzo Vecchio. Uh, his uh, Perseus is holding the head of Medusa that he has just cut off. And uh, you can see the from the uh, from uh, the, that blood is going to be born the winged horse Pegasus. This was sculpted between 1545 and 54 for the Loggia Lanzi. so it's still standing uh, there right now. And this is an absolutely beautiful piece. I'm going to show you another. 
uh, angle to it, but it shows here the, the, the hero holding the head of Medusa. It's absolutely superb. The part of the um, biography of Cellini is his struggle by uh, when he has to uh, make the statue of bronze, that he's always running out of uh, metal for the bronze, so that he's uh, taking all the his dishes to the dismay of his servant or wife, I'm not sure. Uh, he's taking all his uh, plates and everything and pouring it in the furnace. He also received the commission of the bust of Cosimo. And so this uh, seems to be slightly inspired by the work by Bronzino. Um, this bust was made in many exemplars, this one being sent to the fortress of Stella in Porto Ferraio on the Isle of Elba. Rarely uh, for a sculptor, you handle bronze and stone, but in his case, he was a very good uh, sculptor in stone too. And, uh, this is beautiful. Ganymede with the, the uh, you look almost the pet eagle of the young shepherd uh, is extremely beautiful in line and in surface. He produced three marble statues, all of mythological subjects. He also was asked to produce some body of armors. This is a Morion from Francesco de Medici the first. A beautiful work again with all chased and silver plated iron. Um, you can see all historiated stories of battle. And then on the other side, for the same Francesco the first, the shield that he would go with the figure of Medusa, which was supposed to kill the people looking at it, freeze them at least. So moving to the later 16th century, we see that evolution of mannerism. Uh, what happens? Religious reforms, large national states are now ruled by strong leaders. There is an, an evolution in the state culture in Italy. Urbanization, a lot of peasants come to the city for work. Growth of the middle class, we see that very much in Florence, definitely shift in economy from small state to large countries and from regional to uniform style promoted by the church and autocratic rulers so we have seen how the north had a different style and uh, the northeast versus the northwest uh, the uh, Florence in the middle, Rome was different and you would go to Naples and it was different all this is going to become much more uniform and this is due in great part by the expansion of the prints. Um, prints that are taken here and there are very, very important source of inspiration. And we have also the uh, founding of art academies uh, in Bologna, and then it's going to move to uh, then Padua and then Rome. Uh, and then Rome becomes the artistic center of Italy and Europe. And this is where we really see that move uh, towards the Baroque uh, period. The importance of the Pope, we have mentioned that many times in this case, uh, in the middle of the 16th century, Paul III, that is a Farnese of a Roman family uh, is very familiar with the Florentine court, having lived there with Lorenzo the Magnificent. He was made cardinal in 1493 and elected pope in 1534. Uh, he's going to be the one in charge of the reconstruction after the sack of, of 1527. He's going to try to restore the authority of the church. He will support new religious orders such as the Jesuits, and he will be the one opening the Council of Trent, which is the counter reformation, that, that reaction of the Christian, the Catholic Church against the reformed, uh, the new reformed churches up north. He is the one who is going to commission the uh, last judgment, which is considered as a 
mannerist work by Michelangelo. Uh, again, we don't have any uh, importance of uh, perspective. We have some very odd figures that are making the crowd of people that surround Jesus. Uh, so Michelangelo that was terribly struck by what happened uh, at the, the sack of Rome and what's happening in Florence uh, is moving towards the end of his life to that, that more mannery style. His historian, he's the hero of Giorgio Vasari, who was born in Arezzo in 1511, uh, is also going to be educated within the Medici circle. He will be trained in Florence in the circle of Andrea del Sarto uh, and his pupil Hosso and Pontormo. Uh, he is a painter, an architect, and decorated of all work to the Grand Duke Cosimo. But what he is known for mostly is the Vite di Più Excellenti Architetti Pittori e Scultori Italiani, the lives of the most excellent painters, sculptor, and architects that is going to be written the first version in 1550 and revised in 1568. He is also the founder of the Accademia del Disagno in Florence in 1562, and he will die in Florence. He is the one who is going to literally uh, bring Michelangelo to heaven, if you want, because he is the example that he looks, he exaggerates the relationship he had with Michelangelo. He was not as close as he pretends. But he's also, thanks to him, we know a lot about Italian painters and some details invented or real that uh, were around them. I'm just going to show you two general works that he did. This is the Sala del Gran Concilio in uh, the Palazzo Vecchio, where he re this is where actually Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo were supposed to paint two very large um, canvases uh, that were supposed to decorate this uh, room. And uh, Michelangelo never finished. And uh, we're not sure if Leonardo even started that we have the project for it. But uh, so everything was erased anyway, and it was replaced by painting design by Giorgio Vasari. He's also going to be the one in charge of the studio of uh, Francesco de' Medici uh, within the Palazzo Vecchio. It's a small room that was supposed to contain the whole collection of art and of uh, just objects that were considered uh, collectibles, if you want. A big a new fashion in Italy and then very quickly to Austria and Germany and the Northern countries where uh, people, powerful people or sometimes uh, scientific people are going to gather all kinds of examples of what happens around the world with the idea that when you look at it, it's going to go into your mind, make you more intelligent and for artists expand uh, the, the sphere of influences. I'm not going to go too much into this, but this is all to do with all the collectors at the time is that dynamic relationship between art and nature, the four elements, the four seasons, the four temperament, sanguine, melancholic, choleric, phlegmatic, the, the blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegmat has to do with air, water, fire, and earth, ether. Uh, and then you have that combination of rel religious, mythological, historical, and industrial forces. So he is going to be responsible for putting that uh, studio together and for some of the paintings that decorate it. Another great uh, sculptor, and I only picked a few figures. This is Gian Bologna, who was born in Douai, Jean Boulogne. And so his name was Italianized as uh, Gian Bologna. He went to Rome in 54, settled in Florence in, six, in 56, and died there in 1608. He's known because his sculptures, which are going to be very influential on Bellini, for example, are called the figura serpentina. So the fact that it looks like a snake, it's kind of vaults, it's very gracious, but it, it pivots. You can turn around and see that uh, corkscrew 
uh, feeling. This is The Rape of the Sabines by Jan Bologna. Less emphasis on emotion, but definitely more on the very refined surface, uh, cool elegance and beauty. Unknown, another, oh, okay, yes. The Mercury, also extremely uh, gracious, uh, beautiful stand, elongated shape, uh, no expression in particular, but uh, it's all in, in the grace of the position. And then to finish the, the class, I want to talk about Francis uh, I in Fontainebleau. Francis, since the time he set foot in Italy, fell in love with the Renaissance. And once he became king in 1515, he was dreaming only one thing is bring the Renaissance to France. And to do so, he brought a whole series of architects, sculptors, and uh, painters. And these names are by now familiar with, uh, with you, Rosso Fiorentino, succeeded by Primaticcio at the death, early death of Rosso Fiorentino, and uh, Niccolo dell'Abate, who is going to uh, succeed to Primaticcio when he dies. So this is an overall picture of the Palace of Fontainebleau that existed um, prior to Francis I, but who is going to turn what was a rather uh, non-denomination, uh, non or if we can say a small chateau with dungeons and so on, and turn it into an extraordinary chateau that became his favorite. Here is the L of the Belle Cheminée. So this is one of the wings uh, known for beautiful chimneys and then uh, that uh, double staircase going up to the uh, Piano Nobile. The painters are going to be asked to, to design some of these extraordinary new galleries uh, that were linking two important parts of the Chateau to uh, the chapel that was existing. And you can see how it was designed uh, by uh, Rosso Fiorentino and then later on by Primaticcio. I'm not going to go too much in depth about it, but give you an idea of this sophistication. Each of the peers have its own story. Here you can see a, a different view. So you have a kind of a very elaborate frame surmounted by uh, sculptures and the stucco uh, decoration. Here you can see uh, some atlases and caryatid surrounding the story of Venus. And here we have Venus called in Cupid, and then the odd elephant coming into the sea, the royal elephant that must have had some uh, significance for, for Francis, who actually went to Milan and submitted the Lombardy for a while. This is another uh, gallery that, uh, no, sorry, a staircase. Uh, that was done mostly by uh, Primaticcio. This was the uh, staircase leading to the apartments of the Duchesse of Metamp, who was the mistress of Francis I. And here is some detail, and you can see these extremely elongated shapes, not respecting the normal anatomy uh, defined by Michelangelo. So this was the transition period and I uh, deliberately have avoided talking about the Venetian painters where we find some um, mannerism too, but we'll talk about them later on. So next time we will talk about Titian, the sun among small stars, he's an extraordinary painter. We'll talk about uh, Giorgione that uh, was prior to uh, Titian and with whom Titian studied. Uh, and then uh, later on, we'll have a special uh, classes on the Mannerist in Venice. So please let me just 
stop the 